Good morning, class. Today we will talk about the first twelve chapters of Edward Gibbon's *The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire*. I wish we were in the same classroom on a beautiful campus, as the leaves change colour and float to earth. But the university, in its wisdom, has made a decision: remote learning. And it is the correct decision. We shall explore these texts on a technology the Romans could never have conceived possible. <laughs> Before we begin, I must acknowledge your emails. So many emails. Why did I assign the decline and fall? Must we read so much given? The most intrepid scholars among you googled various editions. Why assign the unabridged text? There are hundreds of footnotes in multiple languages. Why not read the condensed version? Marcus Aurelius, an emperor whom you should have encountered in your reading this week, said that if we look back over the past, with its changing empires that rose and fell, we can foresee the future too. Gibbon should impress upon you that the future was already here. Eighteen hundred years ago, you should have read about the Empress Zenobia of Syria, the two Julias, Domna and Misa, who made emperors, and the unfortunate and much maligned Elagabalus teenage priest of the sun god, the first transgender emperor. Your emails argue that this is not enough, so let's try another way. The central question of the decline and fall is simple. People had it so very good in the Roman Empire. How did it go so bad? When I say good, don't take my word for it. Gibbon writes that if a man were called to fix the period of history of the world, during which the condition of the human race was most happy and prosperous, he would, without hesitation, name that which elapsed from the death of Domitian to the accession of Commodus. The vast extent of the Roman Empire was governed by absolute power under the guidance of virtue and wisdom. So, the peak of human happiness, the peak of human happiness, was 96 to 180 AD. Not even a hundred years. The decline and fall is about how things fall apart. It's messy, terrifying, painful, and it ends in destruction and darkness. You don't hear the whole story in the slimmed down version. The things we'll talk about today often get skipped over, but it's crucial that we know the whole story. The whole story. So, uh, sorry. Not sorry. I am not changing this assignment. You chose History 114, the Greco-Roman tradition. You invited Edward Gibbon into your lives. Can you survive it? I recommend a dose of that great philosophy of the great ancient world, Stoicism. To be a Stoic is most unfashionable. But shape your thoughts to the challenge of it. Was that Stoic, Marcus Aurelius, and not Bruce Lee, who said, What stands in the way, becomes the way. So, do the reading. Or drop the class. Still with me? Wonderful. One thing Gibbon teaches us is that little things count. A lot. Keep your eye on the footnotes. Look at chapter 10. Did you get that far along? Okay, just take notes then. Read it later. Near the end of chapter 10, Gibbon describes the total anarchy unleashed in Egypt in the city of Alexandria during the feckless reign of the emperor Gallienus. For 12 years, Alexandria was utterly polarized with violence. Gibbon observes that its residents abandoned themselves to the ungoverned rage of their passions. Every street was polluted with blood, every building of strength converted into a citadel. Alexandria, one of the great cities of the ancient world was irretrievably ruined. You'd think there was some cataclysmic event that set off such mayhem. You'd be wrong. It was the little things. The most trifling occasion, Gibbon writes, a transient scarcity of flesh or lentils, a neglect of accustomed salutation, a mistake of precedency in the public baths, or even a religious dispute were at any time sufficient to kindle a sedition among that vast multitude, whose resentments were furious and implacable. Gibbon saves the most terrifying bit for the footnotes. 
This long and terrible sedition was first occasioned by a dispute between a soldier and a townsman about a pair of shoes. A pair of shoes. Think about that. Reading Gibbon opens up a vast new world to us, and not only how we think about Rome. A key premise of this class is that Rome is our mutual heritage, a story we reach for again and again to understand ourselves. Our circumstances, parallels invite themselves. They abound. <laughs> for instance, you may hear the president called an orange-haired Caligula on social media. But is he? Gibbon wouldn't say so. He'd argue that we have impoverished ourselves by focusing too closely on 200 years of Roman history, roughly 144 BC to 69 AD. The death of the Republic, the creation of the Empire, Pompey, Caesar, Augustus, Caligula, Nero. It's a foundational era in human history, but it is also a very narrow window. Are you determined to find our president in Roman history? Gibbon might point you to Gallienus, that pathetic psychopath who let Alexandria burn. Gibbon describes the chasm between his glorified self-image and the wreckage of his realm in this way. His profuse magnificence insulted the general poverty. The solemn ridicule of his triumphs impressed a deeper sense of the public disgrace. Crave something even closer to the mark? Turn to chapter 12. The Emperor Carinus. He was soft, observes Gibbon, yet cruel, devoted to pleasure, but destitute of taste, and though exquisitely susceptible of vanity, indifferent to the public esteem. In the course of a few months, he successfully married and divorced nine wives, most of whom he left pregnant, and notwithstanding his legal inconstancy, found time to indulge such a variety of irregular appetites and brought dishonor on himself and all the noblest houses of Rome. Carinus was so lazy that Gibbon tells us of how a confidential secretary who had acquired uncommon skill in the art of forgery delivered the indolent emperor with his own consent from the irksome duty of signing his own name. Carinus. Remember him. Remember that name. We'll return to him. But the decline and fall is more than character assassination. It is the story of how a civilization with every seeming advantage falls apart, indulges itself in the sort of political insanity that happened in 193 AD when the infamous Praetorian guards, armed power behind the throne, auctioned off the title of emperor to the highest bidder. And who bought Rome? A wealthy senator named Didius Julianus. His reign lasted only 69 days. The same guards who sold him the throne beheaded him as a common criminal. And almost a hundred years later, in 275 AD, the system broke down again. For eight months, the most bizarre deadlock in political history. Why? The Praetorian Guards and the Senators disagreed on who should name the next Emperor. Did you read this? The Guards demanded the Senate choose. The Senate said, no, you pick. Eight months of this. Eventually, the Senate caved. They elected Marcus Claudius Tacitus. Predictably, he tried to restore the Senate's power. Predictably, the guards ensured his reign came to a quick and bitter end. Six months and twenty days. Did he die of fever? Was he killed by his troops? Who knows? It happened far from Rome, in Turkey. The Senate never elected an emperor again. Gibbon's epitaph is chillingly succinct. The expiring Senate displayed a sudden luster, blazed for a moment, and was extinguished forever. The decline of Rome was prolonged. A hundred, two hundred cuts, stabs made over centuries, decades of panic, misrule, and humiliating defeats at the hands of so-called barbarians, eroded institutions, ate away at civic life, crashed the system. At one moment, six men claimed the purple robes of imperial rule. In a power vacuum, delusions of grandeur were contagious. Gibbon relates the tale of Firmus, a paper merchant in Egypt, who broke into the city of Alexandria, where he assumed the imperial purple, 
coined money, published edicts, and raised an army, which, as he vainly boasted, he was capable of maintaining from the sole profits of his paper trade. Firmus became another footnote. It seems almost unnecessary to relate, says Gibbon, that Firmus was routed, taken, tortured, and put to death by the Emperor Aurelian. Aurelian was a brutal ruler. Gibbon says that a single instance will serve to display the rigour and even cruelty of Aurelian. One of the soldiers had seduced the wife of his host. The guilty wretch was fastened to two trees, forcibly drawn towards each other, and his limbs were torn asunder by their sudden separation. Gibbon quips that the punishments of Aurelian were terrible, but he had seldom occasion to punish more than once the same offence. Of course, Aurelian was murdered, victim of a petty conspiracy. Even those of you who've only skimmed this week's assignment should be in possession of a key fact. It wasn't easy being a Roman emperor. Plague took some of them. Claudius Gothicus, Septimus Severus. We are not alone in history contending with a malignant virus. But a few of Rome's rulers died in their beds. Elagabalus was massacred by the indignant Praetorians, says Gibbon. His mutilated corpse dragged through the streets of the city and then thrown into the Tiber. The Emperor Probus ordered troops to perform the unwholesome labour of draining the marshes of Sirmium in what's now Serbia. His indignant troops broke out into a furious mutiny and thousands of swords were plunged at once into the bosom of the unfortunate Probus. Reformers, such as Severus Alexander or Pertinax, were cut down as readily as predators such as the vicious and tyrannical Caracalla, who was stabbed by a disaffected centurion as he stopped to pee against a wall. Such was the unhappy condition of the Roman emperors, writes Gibbon, that whatever might be their conduct, their fate was commonly the same. A life of pleasure or virtue, a of severity or mildness, and of indolence or glory, alike led to an untimely grave. And almost every reign is closed by the same disgusting repetition of treason and murder. Trying to change the Roman world for the better was useless. It was easier to vanquish the Goths than to eradicate the public vices, quips Gibbon. Only the most singular and ruthless emperors, such as Septimus Severus, could navigate the tumult without being murdered. But the price of his success was high. Gibbon says the people of the Roman Empire were so starved for order and so desperate for tranquility to be delivered by any means that they accepted Severus's endless wars, his debasement of their currency and his mass executions of political opponents. The contemporaries of Severus, in the enjoyment of the peace and glory of his reign, forgave his cruelties by which it had been introduced. Posterity, who experienced the fatal effect of his maxims and example, justly considered him as the principal author of the decline of the Roman Empire. The pages of this book are stained with blood. Gibbon describes a debauched and catastrophic parade of chaos, cruelty and folly from which there is no escape. It is monstrous. I find it so. Yet it is not fiction, not fable. Gibbon's history records the actions of human beings, people just like us. So why read The Decline and Fall? Is there a consolation, hope? I hope you find this book to be the cautionary tale that I do. Gibbon asks us to grasp how precarious our liberty is how delicate our peace of mind should be, to acknowledge how the comforts of our lives, the easy commerce of a debit card, the medicine that cures cancer, the freedom to move freely about the planet, are yoked to human suffering. Capricious politics and bloody wars, poverty and human cruelty. Yet he reminds us of what history can do. The light it shines on us, Yes, we historians excavate and articulate the past, but our thrust is always forward. We lay the vital information at your feet, not only to pass judgment, but so you can make a better choice. Make it now. 
It's a cliché. We are slaves of history. But here's the truth. History doesn't work without us. We can't escape it, but it can't escape us. We animate history. We are the makers of it. I promised to return to Carinus. Did you read to the end of the assignment? Carinus was fighting a fierce battle. His opponent, Diocletian, despaired of the purple and of life. Yet at his moment of triumph, Carinus was tripped up by a little thing. A little thing he'd probably forgotten. Gibbon tells us that a tribune whose wife Carinus had seduced seized the opportunity of revenge and by a single blow extinguished civil discord in the blood of the adulterer. <sighs> that is it for now. Next week, you will read about Christianity, how the Emperor Julian the Apostate tried to turn back the clock on it. You're not off the hook, class. You are responsible for this material. It will be on the final.